Good morning, everyone. Good morning. That wasn't very wholehearted. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> it was probably because mine wasn't very wholehearted. I apologize. Good to see you all. Uh, good to see some familiar faces, some newer faces. Welcome back if it's one of your first times here. Um, it's good to have you with us. We have the privilege of coming together today to worship our Savior um, as brothers and sisters united in Him. And it's something that we shouldn't come to and take lightly. Um, we're actually coming to celebrate the Lord's table, um, to remember that specifically. And we're going to start with two very well-known hymns, but in those hymns are two, for me, two very powerful verses, kind of three. One of them has, they're all powerful verses, but that remind us of the cross. Um, and I just want us to, before we even start to sing, uh, just to bring our focus, I know there's a lot of distraction, try and just um, bring your attention to God, not to me, but to God. Just, um, if it helps you close your eyes, just be prepared. Stop the talking, my wife. <laughs> She's not even listening. <laughs> no, I just, there's a lot of distraction, and I just really want us to, to, be, um, to be intentional this morning. It's so easy to come um, and just to sing the songs, and like halfway through the service, we start to engage with what we're here for. Um, so I just really encourage us, just close our eyes for a few minutes, um, focus your heart upon our Savior. Um, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know him as your Savior, just close your eyes and maybe say, God, if you're real, just speak to me this morning. Reveal yourself to me this morning. But if you know Jesus, just, just fix your eyes upon him for a few moments now. Um, and I'm going to read a, a few verses from Colossians, and then we'll stand to sing together. Jesus, it's because of you that we are here this morning. Mm -hmm. We don't deserve to even be able to breathe. We don't deserve to live um, because of the sin that was in our hearts, because of our rebellion against you. But because of what you have done, Jesus, in coming to, to die for us, to take the punishment of our sin upon yourself, we have every right to be here this morning. There is nothing that turns us away if we've come to you, Jesus. And so whatever we're feeling this morning, God, if we feel rushed, if we feel distracted, if we feel burdened with sin that's, that's evident in our lives, God, we just want to surrender all of that to you again and ask that you'd come, you'd come and fill this place, come and fill each heart. God, come and fill my heart as we worship this morning. Fix our focus upon you. You're the only one that matters. It says in Colossians, in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you are also complete through your union with Christ, who is head over every ruler and authority. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature, and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. But then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual powers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. This is who we've come to, to lift our songs to this morning, to lift our hearts to. Let me encourage us to stand as we sing, and, and let's just declare these, the truths in these hymns together.
you just to lift up your prayers of praise to him for who he is and what he's done in your life.
And God, we thank you that the constancy of your love took you to the cross where those nails pinned our sins to be punished and crucified upon your body. We thank you that you rose again to give us life. And we thank you that we can say no matter what we've done, no matter where we've come from, when we look to you, Jesus, it is well with our soul because of you, not because of us. We give you the praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. Let's just say that together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. And again, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. God, you are worthy of our adoration today. Come and fill us with a fresh glimpse of your constant love for us, your complete love that takes away all sin and all shame when we come to you. God, be honored, we pray. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. If it is your first time here at the International Church, I just want to take a quick moment and welcome you this morning. We are thrilled that you chose to come and worship with us. And in the weeks to come, should you be here in Bucharest, we would hope that you'd come and join us again as we worship our Savior together. Once a month here at the International Church, we take a moment and we kind of, so to speak, push the metaphorical pause button. And what that means is no matter if there's a war raging around us, no matter what might be happening in your life personally, no matter what may be happening inside, we try to say, Lord, we want to pause for a moment all those things, and we want to focus our gaze on you. We want to focus our gaze upon what you've done for us, and we want to thank him. We want to praise him. That's what communion is about. It's just taking a moment to remember our Savior's great sacrifice on our behalf that won our freedom from our sin and from death. The Apostle Paul, as he writes concerning what we're getting ready to do, tells us of some things that he wants us to do. And as we prepare, what I would simply tell you, if you are visiting with us, you do not have to be a member of the International Church to participate. We warmly welcome all who would confess that they love Jesus Christ with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their mind, that you are seeking to follow him every single day of your life, that you're walking, so to speak, as we say, in communion with your Savior. If that is you this morning, it doesn't matter whether you're a member of the International Church, you are welcome to join us this morning as we remember our Savior's death, his burial, his resurrection. Paul writes, and he tells us, he tells us the following as we prepare to take from his table, and I want us to take a moment to take this to heart. He says, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy way will be guilty concerning his body and blood. So let a person thus examine himself and eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning what the body means or drinks and not discerns what his blood means, basically he's drinking judgment upon himself. Paul says that's why many are weak and ill and some have actually died. But he says if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So he invites us this morning to examine our lives. Because when we say we're taking of communion, what that means is that we're seeking to be in communion, proper relationship with him. And I love the way we started this service because one of the things that was kind of a constant theme was no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what you might have done, no matter where you might have been, it doesn't matter. He's welcome to, re he's, he, he has open arms, he's ready to restore, he, he's ready to receive you in, and all you gotta do is turn to him and say, Lord, I want to walk in communion with you. So I just want us to take a couple of moments here to search our hearts, to make sure that we're walking in communion with him so that we can receive his body, we can receive of his blood, and we can remember the sacrifice that he did in a worthy way. So let's take a few moments and examine our hearts.
Paul in writing of that night in which Jesus was betrayed tells us the following about what our Savior did for us. He says that he received from the Lord what he's going to give to you and I now. And he says that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks for it, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then a short period of time afterwards, just shortly after supper, he says that he took the cup. And he said that this cup is the new covenant in my blood, that I've won your freedom. You no longer have to go through the intermediary through a priest. You can come through the one only true high priest. And then he says, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And he says that as often as we do this, as we take of the bread and we drink of the cup, that we will be proclaiming who he is, what he's done for us until he returns for us. We want to proclaim this boldly to the world, the victory that he won, victory over our sin, victory over death once and for all through the empty grave. Amen? That's what we want to do today. Can I get just a couple of quick volunteers who can help me this morning as we pass out the bread and the cup, or, or the bread and the wine? As it is being passed this morning, I wanted to share with you a little bit of hope. Only the Lord sometimes through the power of the Holy Spirit allows us some, some things to happen in a way where everything consistently comes together. And as we were talking about where people find themselves this morning, maybe you're struggling. Can I give you just a little hope? The writer of Hebrews says, since the children, speaking of men and women just like you and me, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus Christ, likewise partook of the same thing. He became flesh and blood for us, that through his death he might destroy the one who has power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to a lifelong process of slavery to sin. But then he says, for surely it is not that he did this for angels, but... He helps those that are the offspring of Abraham. So therefore, he had made those brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and, and, and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for our sins. That's what he did when he died on the cross. He paid for our sins, paid for them in full. There is no longer a debt to be paid and he says this finally, for because he himself was the one who suffered when he was tempted, he now is able to help those who are tempted. That means because no matter, no matter where you find yourself, no matter what the struggle might be, because of his victory, he came, became flesh just like you and I. He became who we are, and he died in our place. And because of the victory that he won, he made it possible. He made it possible for you, for me, to have our sins paid for once and for all. And now he helps us in our weaknesses. He helps us when you struggle. And so, friend, this morning, if you will turn to him and say, Father, I want to walk in communion with you, he will help you do that. So as we take of the bread, as we take of the wine, let's remember not just a sacrifice, but that he is a God who wants to restore. He wants to bring you into reconciliation with him. So let's walk in communion with our Savior. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your broken body. We thank you for your shed blood. The prophet said without the shedding of blood, there could be no covering for sin. And we praise you that your blood covers our sins once and for all. We praise you that you willingly took our nails, you took the spear, you took our thorns willingly. Nobody took your life from you, you willingly laid it down. And you did it all out of love, mercy, and grace for those that you made for us. And through your glorious resurrection, you want our freedom. You want our freedom, Lord. We no longer need to fear death. We no longer need to be bound to our sin. We are free to glorify and to live for you. 
So, Lord, I pray now that as we take of the cup, as we remember your broken body, as we remember your shed blood, that, Lord, we would once again submit ourselves to walking in communion with the one who won our freedom. Lord Jesus, we praise you. We thank you for the victory you won for us. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul says that he broke bread and he gave it to the disciples and he says, this is my body. I'm soon going to take your nails, your thorns, your spear. I'm going to do it for you out of love. I'm going to allow my body to be broken so that your sins can be forgiven. He says to do this in remembrance of his great sacrifice. Do this in remembrance of Jesus. And as he said, shortly after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup represents the new covenant I'm making with you. A covenant that was bore through blood, just like the old covenant was bore through the blood of goats and lambs. This covenant's going to be bore through the blood of the one spotless lamb, the lamb of God. And through his shed blood, your sins will be forever covered forevermore. So he says to do this in remembrance of his shed blood that won our freedom. Do this in remembrance of Jesus. Lord Jesus, we praise you and we thank you. We thank you that you not only want our freedom, but you are living and you are active every single moment of every single day to help us to continue to walk in freedom to walk in communion with you. So, Lord, I pray that not only would we be grateful for what you did for us, but that, Lord, you would deepen our love for you so that we will walk even more with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for winning our freedom through your death, through your burial, through your resurrection. Be pleased with our worship now, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to stand back to your feet as the worship team returns. And if you can, take your cups and pass them to the center, and we'll come and pick them up. We're just going to sing one more song before, um, I think, some notices first, and then Sam is going to come and share God's word with us. And this is a song that we introduced last week, and it just reminds us that um, no matter how we see things, God sees things how they really are, how they are in the spiritual realm. Um, He sees that his blood has covered our sins. He sees that he has victory um, if we look to him. So this song just reminds us that when we look to him, we... We have that victory, and we look to him ultimately through coming to him and entrusting ourselves to him as we pray and submit our worries, our anxieties, our our battles to him. So let's sing this song together.
So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the Bible belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the Bible belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. And all I see are the ashes. You see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So ourselves fully to you again. Keep our focus upon you and what you have won for us through the cross so that we bring all of our struggles, all of our concerns to you and find that everything we need is met in you. You satisfy every need when we come to you. God, keep us on our knees. Keep us before you in humble surrender. For your glory we pray. Amen.
Well, I've already welcomed you this morning, so I'm thrilled that you're here, but I do want to let you know about a few things that are happening in the life of our church. Coming up on Friday night, I hope that many of you are planning to come. We are going to have our Thanksgiving meal here in the building. I did get some news here that we are actually going to be able to do, as we have been doing the last few times we've done this, we are going to have our Scottish dancing time at the end. And so we want to encourage you to come. If you've never done Scottish dancing before... It's a great time. If you don't do it for any other reason, come, because I will tell you this, it's quite a workout as well. You can get in a little bit of sport activity. So please come. We would love to have you come and join us for it. What I do need is I need a little bit of help. We need everybody to sign up what you are actually going to bring. You don't have to sign up for one. If you want to sign up for two or three, you can. I know that we will be signing up for several, so I'm going to pass this around, and I need you to sign up. There's two pages here. There's main dishes, vegetables, salads. There's drinks and desserts and other things on the back here as well. Please sign up for what you can bring that you can participate in so that we can know what we can count on. It does not matter. It's not a traditional, what we call American Thanksgiving meal. This is a Thanksgiving meal for all of our cultures, and we want to experience a little bit from every single one. And so we hope that you will bring your favorite dishes with you. So let me pass that around and have you sign up for us for the Thanksgiving meal coming up on Friday night at 7. Please know we want you to bring a guest with you as well. If you have a friend that you just, maybe you say, you know what, I'm not sure if they'd come on a Sunday. That's fine. Bring them for Thanksgiving. It's a great opportunity for us to get to know them, to build into their lives. And hopefully, as we encourage them, maybe they'll come and join us for worship on Sunday as well. So come Friday night. Bring your guests with you. We'd love to fill up this room with people that are praising God and thanking him for his faithfulness, for his goodness in our lives. Next, I want to let you guys know that uh, we are going to be having our men's retreat the following week. Guys, we've been talking a lot about that. Several of you have already signed up. I'm going to go ahead and hand this back around for the particular reason that maybe one of you didn't get a chance to sign up. You can still sign up today, but we do need to hear from you if you'd like to participate in the men's retreat. So let me pass this around and make sure that every guy who is planning to come does sign up. I know I've spoken with a few of you, maybe even about maybe one of your sons, if they want to participate, they're more than welcome to join us. So please let me have you sign up for them as well and pass that around if we can. So let's pass that around to all the guys. And guys, if you can, if, if you're going to come, please sign up and let us know that you're going to be joining us up in Sanaya. It's going to be a great time together. I know we've been talking about what we believe God is going to do. And guys, I truly believe God has got something special for each and every single one of us. And I, I say that intentionally. I believe he's going to do something special up there in Sinai in each one of our lives. So you will not want to miss this. Make sure that you sign up. Make sure that you come. I believe this is going to be a great time for each one of us up there in Sinai uh, the following weekend. Also, yeah, uh, for for our, those of us who are church members, and specifically for those of you who are involved in church leadership, every year about this time, we have what we call our budget committee meeting, and it's, a prepar it's in preparation of the new year that is coming. 2023 will be here before we know it, and we are trying to get prepared for the new year. So if you are involved in helping lead one of the ministries, the children's ministry, um, maybe you're involved in, in, in leading a, a small group, maybe you're involved in the ladies' ministry, men's ministry, however you're involved in the church, if you have something that you believe that really needs to be part of our budget as we move into 2023, we invite you to come Saturday the 26th right here in the building at 930 as we meet to prepare the budget for the new year. We would love for you to come have your voice as you speak into what God, what we hope that God will do in this coming year. And so please come. Please join us. We would love to have you participate in that as we prepare for 2023. Also, coming up the following day after that, right here in the building, November 27th, we're going to do something a little unique. We've done things for family in the church before, but we're going to extend this this year. We're going to have a family service, a family Sunday, but when we do that this year, we want you to very intentionally, remember that word we've been talking about? Intentionally to talk to your neighbors, talk to those that you work with, talk to those around you and invite them. Why? Because that particular Sunday is going to be a little different. We're going to have something for the kids. They're going to be doing something here where it's going to be fun for the kids that morning. We're going to have something for our teenagers. We're going to have a little bit of everything going on here. 
And it's not going to be quite as long of a service. It's going to be about an hour long, but it's going to be a service where we want our friends to come and see who the international church is. And then afterwards, we, for years, did this thing called meet and mingle in the back where we would have cakes and desserts and other yummy food. Well, we're going to encourage you to bring your dish with you that Sunday. We're going to have kind of a potluck style thing immediately after the service. And we're doing that intentionally because we just want to spend time getting to know your friends. So if you don't bring your friends, we're just going to be getting to know each other more. <laughs> so I need you to bring your friends that Sunday so that we can truly get to know each other and get to know them so that we can encourage them, hopefully, to come back again and to see who we are as a family of faith. So uh, November 27th, bring a friend with you, and let's see what God will do here at the International Church. And, and finally, I want to encourage you, our Christmas celebration will be on us soon, December 10th, right here in this room. Once again, we want to bring our friends. It's What a great opportunity during the holiday season, as the holiday season grows near. Yes, a lot of times people will come and they'll celebrate Christmas. Some people celebrate Santa Claus. Some will even celebrate the birth of Christ, but they don't understand why he came. What a great opportunity to invite a friend to come and celebrate the birth of Christ and learn about the good news of why Jesus came to save us from sins, to give us a hope for eternity. So I hope that you will already be thinking of that special person that you're going to bring with you for our Christmas celebration coming up on December 10th. All right. Well, at this time, I'm going to invite Sam to come. I know that the Lord has put something very special on his heart this morning. Sam, I want you to come, and I want you to just take the word, and let's just see what God will do amongst us today. There we go. All right. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Isaiah 43. Isaiah the prophet, and Isaiah 43, the chapter. Oh, yeah, children, come on. And I, uh, the children are always a reminder to the, to the people of Israel and to us that God is faithful. There's another generation, and God is faithful. So it's always great to see them go. So you guys have fun. I'm going to try to have fun in here with your, with your parents. <laughs> so I'm in, you know, I do most of my... Uh, Ministry and youth ministry. Um, my, me and my wife are missionaries in Ukraine, and we've been here because of the war. We just want to thank you for your open arms and how you guys have loved on us. And uh, just want to, in a sense, just share what God has been working in my heart, and especially through this passage and, and things He's been teaching me in the middle of the war. Uh, as you know, we are a little displaced ourselves. Um, look forward maybe one day getting back to Kiev, but as we're with you, we are happy actually to be with you. God has blessed us being with you. So if you have your Bibles, Isaiah 43, we'll start in verse 1 and go down to verse 7. But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Sheba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not. For I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. God, thank you so much for these wonderful words you spoke to Israel to comfort them in the middle of judgment as you were judging their sin. But God, we also take them as you say them to us because we're your children. Lord, you formed us. You made us. We're yours and you're ours. So God, we thank you, God, that we can know you. God, there is no greater thing than to know you. So Lord, I pray God, that you would hide me behind the precious cross of Christ so my friends here may see Jesus, they may see you, they would want to draw closer to you. 
And God, we just want to confess our love for you. Thank you for the songs we sang this morning. Thank you that the power does belong to you. So God, we, I ask you to speak as only you can through the Holy Spirit this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, if you have a, a bulletin, there's going to be some notes and things on the inside, and you'll need that in a pen here in a second because we're going to do a small activity. I am, I'm a teacher at heart more than a preacher, so we're going to do a little, uh, a little work, okay? So just kind of get prepared for that. As I open up with an illustration, you know, this summer was an interesting summer for us in lots of ways because, you know, the war, we're not being here. But one of the unique things is that I could watch movies in English, <laughs> right? I mean, in Ukraine, we, they're all in Ukrainian, and I learned Russian. So it's a, it's a, I, my kids love going to the movie theaters. They, they understand Ukrainian. They went to Ukrainian school, but I, never, I couldn't understand a thing. So when movies come out, Star Wars and all these things I want to go watch, I had to wait longer <laughs> because I didn't want to uh, go to movies. It was not fun to not understand a thing but just see the visual effects. So when we got to Romania, I learned that movies are coming. And it was a good summer. It was a good summer because I went to watch Maverick. I remember that one a lot. You know, as my friend Lewis has said, it is everything you want it to be. <laughs> Best quote about that movie. And it was. And, you know, we get, we go, we watch the movie with our friends, and, Jer- and Jarrett was there with me. And as we're watching the movie, you know, you get caught up in the story. And I love a good story. And so, uh, and er- you kind of predict, it's a little predictable. I get, but man, it was good predictable. And as he gets to that, that intense part where you know it's like, you know, the, the trench on the Death Star over again, you know, here they go down and they're going to hit the target and they get the target and you're like, oh, and the adrenaline just kind of gives way. Oh, no, here they go again. There's going to be another scene where they have to get into the old F-14. And here they go again. And you're just so engrossed in the story and everything happening. And then the credits come. <laughs> and all of a sudden I realized I have got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> You know, I don't know how long I needed to go, but I had to go. And my friends wanted to stay around and watch all the credits for some reason. I don't know why, why the phenomenon of Marvel has made it to where everybody wants to watch all the credits now. And, uh, but I had to go, so I went to the bathroom. And I think a lot of times life can be the same way. We can get so caught up in distractions and in things happening that we really forget what we need. Because, I mean, there's so much going on around us, so many things that take our attention, and we forget the simple need of knowing Jesus, of knowing Him. It's not just getting something done or doing prayer and Bible study. That's part of it. That's the means of how we get to know Him. But it's more than that. It's our greatest need that we have. And so... I know I, I really wanted to know uh, God when I was, when, and, I, and I look at my journey that God has brought me on. And for most of my life, you know, knowing God was more about knowledge, but what I could know about Him, or how I know how to help, how to do what He wants me to do. And it wasn't really a relationship like a friend you enjoy being with, or just sitting down for a meal. Like my father said to me last time, we were working in the yard, and, and uh, he, we have a, he has about 10 acres there, and he just kind of, I think he, play, he plays around on it. And I was there, and I always help him out, cut down trees and doing all different things on the farm. And, and as we were doing that, I was getting a little frustrated. And my, and my dad looks at me, and he says, Sam, you, we don't have to do this. I just want to be with you. That's the kind of relationship I want with my heavenly father. How, so the question, to kind of continue the series a little bit, maybe dive into one of the topics, is how do we really get to know Jesus as a person, as a friend? How can we intentionally be with Jesus? How can Bible reading and prayer stop being a discipline, discipline, right? i got to do it, and really become spending time with my Savior, with my friend, with my Lord, with my God? How can I intentionally be with God? So I want to dive into that. I'm going to start with, uh, before we dive into Isaiah 43, I want to, um, okay, yes, I want to just kind of look at, oh, there's the illustration for that. Here, two passages of Scripture just kind of hammer this home about being with Jesus. And it says about the disciples, and he went up on the mountain and called 
him to those he desired, and they came to him. This is the disciples. And he appointed 12, whom he called named apostles, so that they might do what? You can read it. Be with him. Not first go out to all the world and preach the gospel to all nations, though that comes. <laughs> but first calling to be with him and that he might send them out to preach. So being was first. And if you look at the Gospels, exactly how Jesus did it. They were with him. They walked with him. They talked with him. And then he sent them out. So first being, then sending. Next, the next passage we're going to look at, and this is after Jesus' death. Look back on the apostles. Now, when they saw that the boldness of Peter and John, this is them before the, the, the Sanhedrin, and they perceived that they were uneducated, common men. That was a very nice way to say that they thought they were stupid and that they were dumb, right? Because why would they be doing the things they're doing? Because they're the smart ones, right? And they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Not that they've done miracles because they just did one. But that they have been with Jesus. They were different people because they had been with Jesus. I had this one, this one quote I really like uh, from a Bible study I did. I think really kind of helps us to see how this, how this works, right? So we be with Jesus to learn from Jesus, become like Jesus, and then sent out by Jesus to do his work his way. Okay, so it's like a cascade, like you see the water there. We, as we spend time with the Lord, we spend time with Jesus, he fills us up with his love, his compassion, with his um, anger to sin, all of those things. And we, we learn from him at sitting at his feet like, like, uh, like Mary, and not busy like Martha. And as we do that, and when we fill up with him, he, in his time, sends us out. And we do his work the way he wants us to. Why? We can do that because we've been with him. We know how he does it. We've learned from the master. So a lot of times we get this kind of backwards in our life. One of my, uh, one of my Ukrainian friends uh, said to us, I uh, remember this was probably about four or five years ago, because you know, unlike other Americans, you guys actually think Ukrainian. Now, they don't know everything about us because we're still very American in a lot of ways. Um, but we do, when we're in America, we feel kind of weird because why don't people in church put clothes on their babies? I can't figure out to this day because it's cold, right? So, but we still think Ukrainian in a lot of ways. And, and I get to think about why was that? And, uh, and I think I didn't intentionally go out and study, oh, hey, this is Ukrainian culture. They do this. They do this. And then it was like knowledge saying, no, I, my friends, my best friends were Ukrainians. I spent the majority of my time with Ukrainians. When I worked in my office, when I was in the office, I was the only one who spoke English, and we, I learned from them how to do an office. I mean, this is, this is uh, we see the people you spend time with is the people you're going to become like. We tell that to our teenagers all the time, and yet sometimes we forget as adults that same principle works throughout our whole life. So the people you with, you be with, you love to hang out with, the people you eat dinner with, you're going to become like them. And the same thing with Jesus. The more time we spend with Jesus, the more we become like him and the more we get to experience his presence. So, Bible reading and prayer, we've talked about, and you can throw in their other disciplines that we call silence, solitude. Um, these are just means of being with Jesus. They're just methods of being with Jesus. They're not magic. They're not something that, you know, automatically you do this and then there's a result. It's a relationship. We don't expect that in our, with our friends. We shouldn't necessarily expect that with Jesus. And so what I want to do, instead of uh, talking about all these principles, I can, I'm a teacher, I can just lay them all out and put a PowerPoint up there and we'll be good. I want you to actually to, to try it out now, okay? So we're going to try something a little different. Uh, so put down your, th- your phone, okay? If you have your phone on, just put it down a second. Get your uh, bulletin. On the back, there's a big blank page, Okay? Big plate page on the back. Get a pen. Okay, everybody. Everybody got, got a pen? We ready? Okay, good. Oh, thank you. Thank you for holding it up. You're awesome. You're my favorite right now. Okay, <laughs> all right. So, everybody got it. Okay, got a pen. We've got a... Uh, thank you, brother. All right. Now, everybody just take a couple breaths. Try to slow down our heart rate. I need to slow mine down. I'm getting excited. So, let's take a couple breaths. Whew. 
try to cut off that voice that says, you need to do this. After church, you're going to go here. Try to cut that voice off. Concentrate on Jesus. Still your heart. Rest in the truth that we just sang. So maybe say a quick prayer. Here's a couple of my favorites. My favorite prayer that I say before I try to read the word is, Lord, open your word to me. Open me to your word. Or maybe like Samuel in the Old Testament, speak, O Lord, for your servant is listening. I'm going to put this on the screen. I want you to rewrite this on the back of your paper. Take your time, word for word, and in the blanks, put your name. We're going to try to personalize this. If we really believe that the words that Isaiah said to Israel are the same words he could say to us, just take the time and write it. We have about three or four minutes to do that. Make sure you write your name in the blanks. Make it your own. Seeing people's eyes. Okay, good. As a teacher, I wait to see for people's eyes to know they're done. As you finish up, no hurry. There's no hurry. All right, I'm not going to say anything super important, or rather God speak to you, so no hurry. But just a couple of questions just to help you think uh, about what you just, just what happened. I mean, it's just four or five minutes. I wish we had an hour to do this, right? But what kind of feelings came when you wrote your own name? I mean, 
make the Bible feel a little more alive. I really believe, I really believe God speaks to us through his word. So hopefully made it feel a little more alive. Um, other things, other feelings you could have. How did rewriting the passage help you to really hear? For me, it kind of, when I rewrite something or I write scripture, even though I know it, it just kind of helps me to slow down. Slow down and kind of just hear what God is saying. What was hard in doing it? Was it hard? I mean, to stop? <laughs> what, what made it so hard for you personally? Because, I mean, for me, it is hard for me to stop. I, I like to type because I can get a lot more done. But making me slow down is a good thing. And then what did God say to you personally? Because God can emphasize something for you that's maybe not for another person. What's God trying to say to you through His Holy Spirit? So these are in your bulletin. You can, I, I encourage you to do this again or to go home and spend some more time you're in your, with this passage and just let God speak to you through it. And what I want to do now is just um, go through it together. And uh, this was a big passage in my life that God really used for me to understand that I really could have a quiet time, we call it quiet time, a Bible study, time with him that, that was with an expectation that he was going to speak. An expectation that he's real and he talks to me. And not just a fairy in the sky or somebody distant, but he's right here with me. And that my, more often than not, I could have a great time with the Lord and not just have a duty that I have to check off. And so uh, this context of the passage, Isaiah 43, Isaiah just pronounced judgment on King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah did a really uh, not so smart thing. He invited the envoys of Babylon into the court and they saw all the riches of Israel. And then Isaiah basically comes to him and says, hey, God's coming and they're going to come back and they're going to take everything you just showed off to them. And so Hezekiah repents and he, uh, God gives him grace in not having that, letting that happen in his time. But uh, in the middle of that judgment, we get this reminder of God to his people that he loves them, that he is there for him. And, and so we get to hear about his presence. And these, I think, are some of the most intimate words in all the prophetic literature. It is well-crafted poetry. Um, I loved Hebrew in seminary, and this is one of those things that I went back, and I don't, know, I don't remember Hebrew very well anymore, but I went back and just kind of looked at it. Uh, with some, and it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful on, on a, so many levels. And in verse 1, he uses God's personal name, Yahweh, who created you. Now, that's the foundation principle of who we are as people and Christians, right? God created us. He, gave a, he created us in his image. And, we, um, and, and, and he knows each one of us by name. Now, I, I'm a teacher, and having to learn names over and over again it gets harder and harder. And it's a discipline for me. It's not natural. And, but I know when I know my student's name and I call them by name, whether it's Dima or Sasha, they feel worth and value because I remember their name. And God knows all our names. I don't know all your names, but he does. So he knows you. And he says, I, um, he says that uh, you are mine. You are God's possession. The filthy as rags. And yet God's possession, all that goes in. You're still his. He claims you. I claim my wife. She's mine. I saw some eyes. Nope, she's mine, right? She's mine. And you're his. And you're, and you're God's. Verse 2 is God is with us. Pass through the waters. I will be with you. This is repeated time and time again in our passage so as I, I think when we talked about Psalm 46 when I preached last time, that the waters do symbolize chaos most, more often than not in Scripture, and here they do as well. God is walking with us through the chaos of life, right? Whether it's a war, other things happening, uh, family struggles, you know, it's just so much that God is walking with us. He doesn't necessarily say he's going to take that away, but he promises he will be right there with us through it. And we can know him and grow closer to him in that. And so control, let's see if I can remember to do this. Oh, you're mine. Um, 
Oh, let's look at uh, one thing Bonhoeffer took so back to our earlier. He says, who am I? They mock me, these lonely questions of mine. Whoever I am, oh God, I know I am yours. He wrote this from prison. So even in the prison, you know, God was with him. He was walking through. He was God's, and God had him right where he wanted him. So control, looking at the waters of chaos around us. Now, control is an illusion, but God is with us in the chaos. So we, things are outside my control. I can't control what's happening around me. I can't control a lot of the troubles in my life. We've had leadership troubles in my mission. I mean, I can't control those things, but I know God is with me. I don't need to fear because he's in control. He speaks about that time and time again in the passage. And I don't need to fear. But as I think about that, I'm like, God, why do you want to be with me? You really know me? You really know who I am and the bad things I've thought and the bad things I've done, the things I don't even want to tell my wife? Do you really want to be with me? And the answer is yes. In verse 3, he says, for I am your God. We are his. Oop. We are his, and he is ours. He's ours. We get to claim him. <laughs> it works both ways. And it's great that I claim Melissa. That's easy for me, but it's, even, it's awesome that she claims me. <laughs> and so, like, that's, a, that's relationship. That's closeness intimacy that we can have, and that's what he desires for us. So uh, I, he chose us, and as, as the verse goes on, he substituted the lie for someone else for us. Isn't this just like what God did in the New Testament? He substituted what we just celebrated by taking communion together is a picture that God substituted Jesus for us. He paid our debt so we can be in relationship to him. That is, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We see it right here. He substitutes Jesus for us. He gave him up so we can be his and he can be ours. Wonderful thing. In verse 4, because you are precious in my eyes and honored. Um, I was, as I was preparing for the sermon all week, I, I take my son to school at BCA, and I was dropping Jared off, or Jared, not Jared, Corbin, <laughs> I always get those kids confused, um, drop Corbin off, and as I were driving in there, we saw uh, two, two of the Ukrainian girls that go to the school, and we know them, because we were, I was at the church, actually, when they first came to Bucharest, and uh, and so knowing their story and hearing them, Melissa was with a little Vika when, when they were just new, probably two or three days. She was doing like a little um, activity with them just to give them something to do during the day. And I remember v Melissa, Melissa telling me later that Vika said her now her, her favorite color is black. It used to be pink, and now it's black. I'm trying to just seeing the hurt and the pain even in this five, six-year-old six little girl. And uh, we got to know the family. And so as I saw the girls walking to school, you know, I just get this, this fatherly, you know, just something the Lord put in. I need to say something to her because I just feel the weight on their shoulders. So I get in, I pull the car in, and I get Corbin just, you know, he just jumps out. Bye, Dad. And he's out. And I see uh, Katya and Vika walking up. And I said, I said to Vika in Russian, I was just like, hey, good morning. How you doing? I'm so glad to see you. You made my day just to see you. And her smile got so big, just so big, just melted my heart. I got back in the car, and that word, precious, the Holy Spirit put in my heart at that moment. And I was like, wow, God, I'm precious her and so the next moments I just sat in my car overwhelmed by God's love I mean we're 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 all dealing with things and just that one reminder so personal to me that he looks at me infinitely more precious than I ever could look at her or my own daughter who's also precious right but that it's how the Lord meets us. And he just in that moment just reminded me that, yes, we're precious. And as the, the verse goes on, we see what I'm precious in your eyes and honored. And I love you. I love you. I'd, I'd, and 
Bill, I'd love you to tell me. I've been, I've been asking this. I've been searching for this. I don't know if there's another construction in the Old Testament that's that way. I love you. you know, first person, second person with love in the middle. <laughs> I don't know of another one. Love is all over the Old Testament. That's not the question. But God is trying to just communicate to Israel. Look, this is personal. I love you. And so it's wonderful. Look at what God is doing. And hear that from God today, that he loves you. And those words are not just words on a page. He demonstrated that for us. In verse 5, God, God starts reminding us again, fear not, I am with you, and I will do what I said I will do. Again, the fear and the chaos, he's with us, he's in control. And in the, verse, the next verse, he says, you know, I'm going to gather all the people up, reminding us of his control over everything, and he's going to make sure of his promises. And then verse 6 is kind of like the opposite of verse 2. And he goes, it looks like chaos to you. He's saying, Israel, I know it looks like chaos when I say I'm going to judge you, but I'm going to bring you all back together. And he did later on. If we read the rest of the history of Israel, he goes, I got this. Just love me. Be with me. We've got it. I've got this. And so he's going to work it out. And then verse 7, we see kind of the opposite of verse 1, that he calls us by name, created us for his glory, Informed me, but in, the, in this one, he's the one who's calling us. So he calls us into this relationship because he created us, he loved us, he sent his son to die for us, and in that we can know him. So, this is in, in Hebrew poetry, they call this uh, a chiasm. Okay, the PowerPoint didn't quite work out, but it actually kind of narrows in to a one main point, or the main, there's lots of points there, but one main, and that. If you follow it down from verse 1, matching it with verse 7, all the way down to the middle, the key words there is, I love you. So we've talked about that message. I want that to be the main message today. God loves you. God loves you. He wants that relationship with you. So fear not. I am with you. Um, there's a, I want to kind of just quickly go through Maybe wrong approaches. Sometimes it's good to know what something is when we look at what something is not. Okay, so that's the kind of the approach we want to look at this. In the book, I really recommend if you want to dive into this topic called With Reimagining the Way You Relate to God. And he puts uh, a lot more in depth of what I'm going to do, but uh, four wrong postures or approaches of relating to God and how Bible reading and prayer can, can be uh, manipulative and not relational. Okay? We can use Bible and prayer with God to be trying to manipulate God to do what we want Him to do and not being relational in Him. He's inviting us into a relationship with Him. So I want to try to look real briefly at these so uh, we can examine ourselves and look, maybe, is, maybe this is how I'm, I'm doing this. Um, it's, like a, it's like a bad friend, you know? You know, a good friend and a bad friend. A bad friend is only a friend when they can get something from you, right? We don't like those kinds of friends, and we don't want to do that to God either. So uh, the four kind of ways, uh, uh, four words, they're right there in your, uh, in your bulletin. I want to kind of get these up here. Rules, knowledge, gifts, ministry. Rules is like being with God is not following the rules. Okay? We need to follow the rules. No, parents, no, all the kids are in there. They didn't hear me. Good. <laughs> we being with God is not following the rules. This is, this is the mentality, the approach to God, that if I follow the rules, so God, God will bless me. Well, God's already taken care of the rules. The rules really, in a sense, in a sense, are not important anymore. It's the relationships that's important. So we can, we can exchange. We think, hey, if I worship God, if I have good behavior, God will, I can expect God to do whatever it is I want. This is ancient religion. This is back to the Greeks. This is what everybody's done for a long time. If I do this and this and this, I will have good crops. This is not our relationship with God. This is not how he wants the Bible then, this becomes just a book of rules that I need to follow in order to get God to do what I want. And prayers just become pleas of mercy because in reality we realize as sinful human beings we can't follow the rules. And so it leads, up, leads, to, leads to, bad, to depression, to other things that, you know, we can't do this. It leads to slavery. I used to think like this a lot when I was younger. I would think, hey, if I read my, if I, if I read my Bible today, then God will bless my day. I'll find a good parking space. 
just not in Bucharest, right? <laughs> right? So, uh, number two, gifts. Gifts, and this is our uh, uh, knowledge. Just do knowledge. For being with God is not gaining knowledge. Being with God is not gaining knowledge. You don't, you, you're not trying to get through content when you're being with God. No, your Bible study is not getting through the Bible study. The, that's not the goal. The goal is actually to be with God. You know, we need God's wisdom, yes. But do I need God's wisdom to be successful? Am I, do I want God as like a professor or an expert that I just sit under and learn from? I just want his knowledge. I don't want him. There's a big difference there. And so the Bible becomes what? A textbook. This is just a textbook so I can figure out how to live life. I exchange the principles of the world, you know, whatever Google says, <laughs> and exchange that for biblical principles. It does not have relationship. That's not what God wants either. And knowledge will end because we cannot know enough. We cannot control things enough to get the result we want. And reduces, it just prayer then becomes non-important because I'm the one trying to do it. I've done this a lot in ministry. I go and I plan out a whole event and think I had the best strategy done. And then I, oh yeah, hey, I need to pray about this. You know, that's that wrong approach to God. Next is gifts. This is uh, taking consumerism and, and putting it onto God. God's like, you know, Santa Claus. <laughs> so he only exists to give me what I want. And in the end, what's the Bible? The Bible becomes a book of formulas to figure out how to get God to give me what I want. In extreme form, this could be health and wealth, right? Extreme. But also very subtly, this could be, um, you know, uh, trying to figure out how to say the right words or do the right thing so that God will, you know, do whatever it is I want him to do. Whether it is take this situation away, stop the war, whatever that might be. We can subtly go in our own hearts to that same, uh, that same kind of mentality, that same approach to God. And what this does is prayer no longer becomes communion with God. It becomes a manipulation, a trying to get God into a corner where he'll do what I want him to do. And this reduces God's love to giving gifts. I'm, you know, I love my kids, and I'm not going to give them everything they want because that's just not loving to them. They don't need everything they think they want or Google tells them they need to have. He sends difficulties and sorrows and joys and victories and all of those as a package deal with him so that we would know him more. And then last is mission, our ministry, our mission. This is a big one for me that I've probably defined most of my adult life, to be honest with you all, is that God, do, being with God is not doing ministry. Spirituality does not equal uh, ministry, right? And they don't, they're not the same. It should flow out. Your ministry should flow out of your time with God, not the other way around. So, and in the end, what we're telling God is, God, you need me. You need me to do the Great Commission, so the Bible ends up, instead of being a place where we go to to find God, it becomes the source of motivation or marching orders or whatever it is. Hey, I need, to, I need to read the Great Commission every day so I'm still motivated to go and do things for God. That's not what God wants. He doesn't want you to do anything for you. Acts 17, Paul says he doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. He can do it himself, but he wants to use us in that relational aspect with him. And so... It is not, ministry is not the, the irreducible center of the Christian life. And prayer is not just a praying for God to bless my ministry or to bless whatever it is I'm working on. When I look back at my life, I feel so convicted on that for many years. That really was, ministry became my idol. And that took the place of my relationship with Jesus. So really, what does it look like with God? And we're coming toward, to the end here, guys. So hang in with me. With God. The goal is not using God. But the goal is God himself. The goal is not using God. The goal is God himself. Whether it's my quiet time, whether I'm praying, whether I'm looking at his word, whether I'm walking down the street, whether I'm hanging out with my son playing Legos, no matter what that is, realizing God's present, he's with us right there in the moment. We hear from him. And I think this is where looking at who God really is in Isaiah 43, and where he's really saying, hey, this is the essence of who I am, really helps us to center our thoughts and to find a, um, a place from which we can, we can hear him. So the goal of Bible reading, prayer, 
meditation, silence and solitude, all of these things, is communion. I love that we took communion this morning because that word really captures, it's more than communication, it's communion. And that means being together. It comes from the, one of the English words commune, which is a people who share everything one with another. And that's kind of what it is. We share life together with God. So God doesn't want me to follow the rules perfectly. That's why he sent Christ. The rules are not a barrier to him. He blesses me and gives me good gifts because I'm his child. But the greatest blessing is being with him. That's the greatest reward. He's the best gift. Love when Jesus said, hey, I send the Holy Spirit, so he will be with you. That's wonderful. He's the gift. He's the best. Yes, he wants me to be missional. He wants me to be a part of the Great Commission, what he's doing here. But the posture that I'm not on my own. Because when it fails, what I think it should be fails. And the chaos comes. And he'll allow that chaos in our lives. He's inviting us to be with him as he does Israel in this passage. Because, yeah, it's coming. Judgment's coming. Chaos is coming. But be with me. Be with me. The war in Ukraine for us has stripped away many things that we hold dear, that we thought we needed all the time. And God has been gracious to replace some of those things with good friends here. And we're very thankful for that. And it's amazing that even in this, he desires to shower off his love. Last little quote here. In other words, this is from the book I read. In other words, God would cease to become, become how we acquire our treasure, and he would become our treasure. Become our treasure. Remember, the disciples were with Jesus before he sent them out. They were with him before he sent them out. So, in conclusion, I, I want to just do a couple principles uh, for spending time with God. And these are not like... Um, gospel like you know right from scriptures these are just things that i've thought about and i've learned from others and i do myself just to kind of help us to have a, a time with the lord that's that's really feels great i mean it feels like you've spent time with a friend i mean i'm not trying to you know, i'm not trying to be touchy feel i don't want to be what do they call it like um uh, sympathy, I don't know, whatever that word is, and I forget. I'm not trying to do that, but I do, I do believe that we should experience God. I think that is a great way to look at our relationship, because that's their sharing of experiences is building relationship with one another. So I want to just kind of give some, some ideas on how we can better experience God as we read the Bible, as we pray, as we evangelize, as we do all these things that we're intentionally doing. So here's a couple of them. First is slow down and grab a Bible. Slow down. The pace of life, like we tried to slow our brains down a little bit by taking a couple of deep breaths and trying to center uh, our thoughts on Christ. Um, slow down and trying to get rid of distractions, you know, finding a place that I get up before my kids get up. That's just my, uh, my way of doing it. Uh, and, and, or after I take Corbin to school. <laughs> it's one of the two because I need that quiet for me and just get that quiet. And so and grab a Bible. Uh, this is like we've said so many times, uh, Bill's already said this a lot, this is our main means of spending time with, with the Lord is right here. So grab your Bible, um, know where it's at. I, I recommend actually getting a journal so you can write. Actually, this is the first year of my entire life that I have kept a journal up all year. And I think I need to keep doing it and keep doing it. Why? Because it slows me down to where I have to think about what I'm doing. And honestly, a lot of this is just gibberish. <laughs> it really is just gibberish. But it's my gibberish and it's my time with the Lord. So this is important to me because this chronicles my relationship with him all year. And so those things help. They're not in the Bible. You have to do a journal. Right? I'm not saying that, but it definitely does, I think, help us in the crazy, fast-paced world to slow down. Um, so grab a while to find. Yeah, okay. Next is develop a healthy rhythm of life. And this is in general. Uh, diet, exercise, all those things do contribute to how awake you are when you try to read the Bible. And these are, uh, sometimes we don't think they're spiritual, but the spiritual sacred line is not in the Bible. So they are, we are whole people when we come and approach the Lord. And he also is concerned about those things. So develop a healthy, healthy rhythm of life. Uh, um, limit the time on your phone. Limit the time you you watch entertainment, all those things so that we can not be so rushed. And next, carve out time to be with God. Uh, don't rush. 
If you're reading a devotional book, uh, a devotional book, and there's a passage in there, look it up in your own Bible. It might be printed there, but looking it up in your own Bible to me is just is awesome because I can see where I where where I get, without all His words, I can see what God is saying. And at the same time, later on when I'm thinking of that, and God brings it back to my mind, I can go back in my Bible where it is. So I really recommend just kind of, if, if you're reading a book, which is another great way to spend time with the Lord, but that centers on His Word, look up the, look up the passages in your own Bible. And also that means if you're going to say yes to this, you're going to have to say no to something else. And that can be the hardest part in our busy lives. And next, expect God to speak to you. Sometimes we don't have that expectation that God's really going to show up. But I promise in, in the times that I really, that God, I really need you to talk to me. I'm struggling today. I do not love these people that are doing these things to my friends. God, I need you to speak to me today. And it's amazing. <laughs> he shows up a lot of times in those desperate situations. So expect God to speak to you. And, and that is, comes with experience. And also, don't do the same things all the time. Uh, spend, spend time just sitting. Go for a walk. Uh, read a theology book or read a Christian biography. Uh, read through the book of a Bible slowly. Read the whole Bible in a year. Uh, read the whole Bible in four years. You know, just pray with a list. Pray without a list. Being, your relationship with your friends is not doing the same things all the time, except for going to the Chinese restaurant after church because it's the best restaurant in town. <laughs> but you, know, you want to, your relationship with the people is, is, has variety to it. So do the same thing with God. There's not a rule here that you have to always read the Bible in a year. Uh, next and less is, oh, let me go to the next one here. Next is don't uh, do the same things all the time. Disciplines are methods of spending time with God. This is more of a reorientation of the way we use the word disciplines in English. We look at disciplines as things I have to do. No, they are methods of spending time with God. You don't have to do it. You get to do it, as my dad says, and spend time with the Lord. So disciplines are methods of spending time with God. Um, last, learn to ask yourself questions. Learn to ask yourself questions. My favorite devotionals. If you want a list of them, we can. I'm sure Bill has his own list. We all have our, our growth of favorite favorite devotionals. My favorites are the ones that have good questions in them. That at the end of whatever I'm reading, there's questions that make me stop and think and write in my journal what I think the Lord is speaking to me, or where I see in someone else's life this principle live it out, lived out, or where I need, see I need to live this principle out, or where uh, I need to have a heart for a person uh, that I don't necessarily at this time. Those questions give us things to ponder, to meditate on. So in other words, this is also a meditation journal where all my meditations are in here. Not all of them are good, by the way, <laughs> because I had rough days too. So I hope and pray that just these little, these, these little helpful things will be, help you be intentional about being with Jesus. And uh, I pray that the Lord will use them. And the goal, remember, the goal is, the goal is communion. The goal is to be with Him, not to get it done. So I pray, let's pray together. God, I pray that my friends here and all of us every day, Lord, would not seek to just get something done, but Lord, we would be with you. Lord, as you said in your word, you love us. God, there's no, we're, we're precious because you made us. It's, it's, you, it's all you. You did Jesus. You sent him. You died on, you died on the cross for us. You did it all. And you declare it. So, Lord, I pray, God, that we give us the desire, motivation to be with you. And, Lord, out of that flow everything else in our, in our lives. Lord, we love you. God, we need you. And I just thank you so much for this church. Thank you that we can spend this time in your word. Be with us today. And, Lord, may we not forget, Lord, you're always, your presence is always here. Well, we can always talk to you. You are our God. Lord, you're our Lord. You're our friend. Lord, you're all a present help in time of trouble. And you're a present in time of joy. So we love you. In your name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Sam. We're going to sing this, uh, I guess, a modern hymn, I don't know, or an older chorus. I don't know how you would describe it, but hopefully it's well known to all of us. Um, the, the chorus is just really simple, um, but actually really profound and exactly what Sam has been encouraging us to remember, that knowing God, there is nothing greater. Um, he's everything. If that's not where you recognize your heart is at, but it's where you want your heart to be at, you can sing this as a prayer. Um, if it is where your heart is at, you can declare it as the truth. Um, the reality is in our lives, there are times where it is where we're, where we're at, and there are times where it isn't where we're at, but we can um, just entrust that to God again. So I think we can all sing this if we know it, wherever we're at. Um, but for many of us, it might be a prayer just out of conviction from what we've been reminded of, that we need to seek after him and seek to know him above all things and to remember and declare that that's, that's the greatest thing. So let me encourage you to stand as we sing. All I once held dear, built my life upon all this world with this and was to own. All I once thought came, I have found it lost, spent and worthless now. As we go, just listen. 
But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law from doing those good deeds, but that which comes through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, so that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by all means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would not only go with us, but that you would make that the deep desire of our heart, that we would long to know you more, that we would walk every moment of our days in communion with you, that your spirit would guide us, and that we would know your will that we would be glad that it would be our joy to walk in it. So, Lord, make that our prayer to know you more. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a blessed Sunday. You're dismissed.